Well, good morning, everyone. If you're visiting with us, we're very glad that you've come our way. We're always thankful for visitors, and we, we want you to know that you're our most honored guest, and we hope that you'll take every opportunity to visit us, and certainly if you have questions, those are always welcome as well. So thankful for all those that participate in uh, services. We're thankful for the song leading and, and the prayer and those types of things. Always thankful for everyone that helps out. Uh, certainly, we are coming up on that next teacher quarter. Uh, if you'd fill out one of these slips, I believe there's still a stack in the back. If you could get that to Carl or myself, we try to work from your preference of age group and, and time of year, and we try to work together as a family so all those quarters are filled, and that, uh, that's a very good thing for our, our young people being able to be taught and to get that Bible knowledge that they, they really need uh, as they are growing and maturing. You know, this week we think about, I think, freedom many times as we think about the 4th of July and, and those type of things, and people are looking for freedom. And I thought about that a little bit, is uh, you can find all kinds of things uh, that are free or associated with the word free. You know, uh, a lot of people are searching for that being debt free or financially free. Uh, you start thinking about being pain free. Smoke-free. We look for maybe crime-free areas. Some people are fighting to be cancer-free. You know, we think about the foods and things. There's some things that are sugar-free. Uh, we think of fat-free, even caffeine-free. There's all kinds of things out there associated with the word free. And we certainly think of, of freedom. You know, I think in this country we do think about many times the physical freedom which we have, and, and that certainly is something precious that we, don't, we do not want to take for granted. But I think so many times that those things that are right in front of our face that we are, are blessed by, so many times we take those things for granted. We take the physical freedoms which we have for granted. And I think many times perhaps we take spiritual freedom for granted. You know, I think of the children of Israel. We remember the children of Israel, they have been slaves in Egypt for a long period of time, and now God has decided that they will be free. And he utilizes Moses and Aaron, and he sends them to Egypt, and we have the, the ten plagues, and uh, we have the children of Israel, a group of millions of people, leaving Egypt, physical freedom. And they, they start their journey away, and it's amazing how many times the children of Israel almost take that physical freedom that they have for granted. In fact, on their way to the Red Sea, there, there are multiple opportunities through their journey to the Promised Land that they say, you know what, maybe we should just go back to Egypt. Maybe we should just go back to slavery. And you think about that, sometimes people handle their spiritual lives that way. Is that God granted the Israelites physical freedom and they say, wait, 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 we want to go back. Wait, go back to physical slavery? But you know what? When we think about our spiritual lives, God has granted us something much more precious than so many of these freedoms that people pursue on the physical plane of life. God has granted us spiritual freedom. Do we take it for granted? Has God granted us spiritual freedom from sin and we say, you know what? Why don't I just go back and be a slave again? You know, many people handle their spiritual lives that way and it's unfortunate. You know, I do think of physical freedom. I think many times we perhaps take that for granted. Actually, I think I know that we take it for granted in many respects. You know, things were said around that time of July 4th, you know, give me liberty or give me death. You know, when it comes to spiritual, really those are the only two choices you have. You will have spiritual freedom or you will have spiritual death. Are you searching for the spiritual freedom that God offers? In John chapter 8, verse 32, John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is the source, really, of freedom. And we need to think about that when it comes to our spiritual lives. We better get spiritually free from sin because the cause is death. And there are many sins that can trap us. And I think the sa Satan is utilizing those at all times. And there are many of those which he uses to trap individuals. As we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see a list of sins that will keep individuals out of the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 
The Bible says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revile, uh, revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Spiritual freedom allows us to enter the kingdom. To have an eternal life with God to avoid the spiritual punishment. And before we think too much of the people we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, what we need to understand is at one point we were all under the slavery of sin. Well, how is that? Well, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it talks about the idea of sin being a transgression of the law. Sin is a transgression of the law. Well, what law are we talking about? We're talking about the law of God. When the law of God is violated, that is sin. And we understand that once we really reach that age of accountability, that really all have sinned. We think of John, uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all broken that law. We've all broken God's law. In, in Romans 3 and verse 10, it says there's none righteous, no, not one. Is there anyone here guilty of sin? And if we're honest with ourselves, we'd have to say, yes, I'm guilty of sin, I'm a slave to sin, and then I will bear the punishment of sin. Well, what's the punishment of sin? The punishment is death, and we're talking about spiritual death. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you understand the relationship mankind has with sin? Breaking the law brings a punishment, and that punishment is death. And Satan wants to do everything he can to make sure that we stay enslaved to sin, stay enslaved to, to breaking the law of God over and over and over again. Certainly many sins are public, and we can see them, but many sins are private. And actually, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, if you read through that list of sins, I would argue that about half of those sins are public, and about half of those sins are private. Sin will enslave you. Sin has a punishment that coincides with it. And what we are so thankful for is that God offers us freedom from sin. The question is, is do we take advantage of that freedom? Do we take that freedom for granted? And do we really understand the freedom which Jesus provides? For the rest of our time, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6. If you'll turn your Bibles over there. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 17. And we're just going to go throughout this passage and just make some observations about freedom and the freedom which we have because of Christ Jesus, those who have become Christians. As we look in Romans chapter 6, we certainly can't focus on the whole chapter, but certainly there's a whole lot of subject material there. We're going to pick up in verse 17. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. It says, But God be thanked that though we were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. You know, there's a saying that freedom, you know, isn't free. And we think about that idea in a physical context is we understand that there were a lot of sacrifices in order for physical freedom to be obtained. And really, physical freedom to be maintained takes a price as well. And really, when we start to think about spiritual freedom, do we understand the price which it took to get us away from the punishment of sin and to really free us from the bondage of sin? Is that we understand that the cause was the blood of Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about the idea of redemption. We talked about Hosea, and we talked about him marrying a prostitute, and his wife is unfaithful to him. And we got to look at that and think about that and consider that, is that his wife was unfaithful to him, and then his, his, uh, the husband, Hosea, he comes and he buys his wife Gomer back. It appears she ends up on some type of slave block of some type, and he has an unfaithful wife, and he actually redeems her and buys her back, and the expectation is faithfulness. 
You know what? I think redemption lines up with freedom quite well. Is that freedom has a cost. Just like when we redeem something, there's a cost. Freedom has a cost. And that cost was paid by Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus provides freedom, liberty, and freedom in many respects. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says this. And it says, And this occurred because of the false brethren secretly brought in who came in by, uh, by stealth to spy out the liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. There's an idea that Jesus brings liberty and freedom. And that liberty and freedom is in Christ Jesus. It is in no other place. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says all spiritual blessings are in Christ. We see that liberty is in Christ. In other passages, we see that there's no condemnation in Christ. We see that salvation is in Christ. You know all spiritual blessings are in Christ? The question I would be asking myself is how do I get into Christ? Where liberty and freedom is. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage. Jesus offers freedom. Freedom from sin, the bondage of sin, the punishment of sin. But as we turn our attention back to Romans chapter 6, it says, But thank be to God that though we were slaves to sin, yet we obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Do we understand that accessing the freedom of Jesus Christ involves obedience? In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And you know what? Our world tries to run away from obedience to God. And you know what? I don't know. I thought about it a lot this week. Can you have freedom without law? Can you have freedom without obedience? And, and I think about that in our, in our world in a physical sense. Can you really have freedom without law? Can you really have freedom without obedience? And I don't think it's too much different from a spiritual things is that if we want freedom, spiritual freedom, it comes with obedience. And I think that works on people's minds because I think sometimes we think about freedom and we think of freedom with no strings attached. No, there's a lot of strings attached to freedom. There's a cost associated with freedom. There's obedience associated with freedom. And I would suggest there's even law associated with freedom. Freedom is a beautiful and wonderful thing. But this idea of freedom with no cost is an idea that I think the Bible does not teach. Freedom is in Christ Jesus. Freedom is in the church. And you know how the church was purchased? Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. This is written to the elders there at that congregation. It says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Freedom has a cost. We think about obedience. We think about those things. Jesus has paved the road to freedom. The question is, is will we walk on the road which he has paved? Will we walk on the narrow path described in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14? In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, the Bible says this. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if... When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now re uh, received reconciliation. You understand that we have a relationship with God, and that relationship... When we sin, we break God's law. Is God happy when we break the law? No. There's only one way to get back in peace with God, to be reconciled to God, to be redeemed, to get back in a right relationship with God. And the only way to do that is Jesus Christ. Jesus offers that pathway. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see that phrasing again. In Christ 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is in Christ. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. The question must be, how does one get into Christ? Where freedom lies. You know, we think about these things. Is people want a freedom without any cost. They want a freedom that does not cost them and does not cost others. But certainly as we go through the Bible, we think about Jesus and what he has really demonstrated to us. In Hebrews chapter 5, we get to see a picture, just a, a slight picture of what Jesus has done. In Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse uh, 8, the Bible says this. It says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since we have become dull of hearing. Do we understand that Jesus demonstrated faith as well? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Is Jesus heard from God the Father what he needed to do to pave the road to freedom in terms of reconciliation and peace and forgiveness and mercy and all of those things is that he obeyed and he suffered and he purchased a path of freedom. Jesus demonstrated faith. And I think we have to demonstrate faith as well as when God asks us to do something, we should do it. And I think in many ways that has been lost all over our country. The idea of obedience. Freedom is tied to obedience. Jesus is the author of salvation to all who obey Him. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23... It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye who practice lawlessness. Now that sounds like obedience to me. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You understand that God does offer freedom. But it's freedom that comes with a cost. It's freedom that comes with obedience. And that needs to be understood. You know, I think we could make a physical illustration. I think freedom could be purchased for someone in a physical way, but they could possibly not take advantage of it. I think it would be silly to do that. I think it would be foolish to do that. But if somebody said, hey, you're in physical slavery, here, I will pay for you to have freedom. I will pay the price so that you can be free. And the person says, you know what, I'm fine right here. I'm not going to move. I'm going to stay right here. I'm not going to take advantage of that. Jesus has offered access to freedom. The question is, is will we take advantage of it? And I think that is the question, is will we take advantage? As we look at Romans chapter 6 and we continue on, we certainly see that picture uh, of what God is offering in, in verses 17 says, but God be thanked that though we were slaves to sin, yet we obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And we can see what these individuals do to become Christians. Verse 18, it says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Whoa, what's going on here? I have given up being a slave to sin, but now I'm going to be a slave to righteousness. Once again, I will emphasize, when you start thinking about freedom, freedom has a cost. Freedom has always had a cost. You know, when you obey Jesus, there are some things that you're supposed to leave behind. You know, you think about that. If somebody's physical freedom was purchased, and they say, well, yeah, I know my physical freedom's purchased, but I'm just going to continue to do these things that I've been doing this whole time, then are you really free? What did Jesus come to free us from? He came to free us from sin 
the bondage of sin, and also the punishment of sin. And it's interesting, if God has freed us from sin, breaking His law, and freed us from the punishment of sin, why would we go back and run with those things that we used to run with and do those things that we used to do? If God has purchased our freedom, why are we running around and saying, I still want to be a slave to sin? I still want to be engaged in sin. You know what? People do that with their spiritual lives many times. Many times individuals will be baptized for the remission of their sins. Their sins will be washed away. We look at Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Paul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. People are baptized. Their sins are washed away. They have a spiritual freedom. But yet, many times, what do they do? They run back to spiritual slavery. They run back to sin. They run back to breaking the law. They run back to the problem why they needed Jesus in the first place. Jesus has paved the road to freedom, but we see in Romans chapter 6, we see the idea of obeying, and then we see this idea of being a slave on the other side of our freedom. Is that, yes, you were a slave to sin, but now there are some things you have to leave behind, and there are some things that you need to do. There are some things that you need to do in your walk with God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now we understand that we're not going to be perfect, but there are some people that deliberately run back to sin and run back to slavery. And I don't think that that is what God wants and desires. The question is, is how are you handling the freedom which God has afforded you? Are you running back to sin? Are you running back to slavery? There's a lot of people that believe in God. The question is, you believe in God, will you obey God? There's a lot of people that run around and say, oh yes, I I believe in God. You believe in God, will you obey God? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In 1 John it talks about these, this idea of these individuals that are running around and saying that they know God. In 1 John it says, By this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in Him. Now that's quite a picture there in 1 John. It says there's a lot of people running around saying, I know God, I know God, I have spiritual freedom. By this we know that we know Him if we keep the commandments. He who says, I know Him, but does not keep the commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. There's a lot of people running around saying, I'm spiritually free, but they keep running back to sin and they keep running back to slavery. Oh yeah, I'm free, but I'm still running back to where I was. I'm running back to be a slave. I'm running back to the plantation, if you will. Is that they had, these people had physical freedom They were granted freedom, and then somehow they're running back to exactly where they are and say, I'm going to do the same things I've always did. Do the same things I've always done. You know, the devil, the demons believe. James chapter 2 and verse 19, I believe, it says, Even the demons believe and tremble. What separates a demon from a child of God is a child of God obeys God to the best of their ability. Even the demons believe and they tremble. James chapter 2 and verse 19. The separation point is those that obey. We think of John chapter 12 verses 42 and 43. This is in the time of Jesus. John chapter 12 verses 42 and 40. uh, Yeah, John chapter 12 verses 42 and I believe 43. It's talking about some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this is what it says, John chapter 12. It says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Wait, there's a whole bunch of people here in Jesus' time. It says they believe in Jesus. That's not the end of the story. John chapter 12 says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You know, when you think about that, there's people running around Jesus' time, and they're like, yeah, we believe Jesus is who he says he is, but we're not going to obey him. Well, why wouldn't they? Well, it tells us, actually, it fills us in. It says, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Have you ever thought about that? That there are people running around 
that believe in God, but they will not do what God has asked them to do because of the world. And I think that's something we have to think about because I think the pressure in our country just seems to be building. The pressure seems to be building around Christian ideas, principles, and the Bible itself, trying to live a good and godly life, is that the pressure is going to increase, perhaps. And as that pressure increases, this question is going to become more and more evident every day. Is will you do what God has asked you to do, or will you not do what God has asked you to do? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things that I say? You know, Revelation actually adds a couple things to the list of individuals that won't make heaven. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it says the cowardly and the unbelieving. Now, I've thought about that word cowardly for a long time. Cowardly. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it rattles off a big list. It says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. The cowardly. Perhaps the cowardly are those that do not obey God. See, a lot of people, it seems like people want freedom without change. But we don't see physical freedom without change. Is, is that if somebody goes from being a slave to free, we understand that there are changes that are there that take place. And if spiritual freedom is to take place, there are some things that have to take place as we try to serve God and try to live a better life. Freedom has costs. It has costs that the pathway has been paved to freedom, and we understand that we see the idea of obedience there. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's interesting how many conditional statements we find in the Bible. It's actually in a fantastic word study. Look up the word if. If, 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 if. You know how many times the word if appears in the Bible? Conditional. Well, in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 7, it says, But if we walk, but if we walk. There's a lot of conditional statements in the Bible, and I think that we need to understand that just as physical freedom can be lost, spiritual freedom can be lost as well. Jesus did not purchase, and really when you step back and you think about it, I don't know how we come to another conclusion. Uh, when we step back and we think about what Jesus gave, that we could have spiritual freedom, how can we look at our lives and say, you know what, God is okay with my life just the way it is. If God was okay with our life just the way it is, Jesus would not have to come and die. There's a problem in our life, and those problems need to be sorted out. Jesus did not come and die and purchase freedom so that we would stay exactly the same. You know, I think of Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Do we understand that everyone has an opportunity to become a New Testament Christian? Everyone has a chance at spiritual freedom. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we must live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Jesus did not die on the cross so we would run back and be a slave again. Jesus did not die on the cross so we would run back and be a slave again, a slave to sin and lust of the flesh. That's not why Jesus died. He died to redeem for himself a special people zealous for good works. Do we forget about the cost of freedom? Do we forget that freedom came at the price of blood? And we're talking about our spiritual freedom, the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that? I think that's why when we look at the when we look at communion laid out in the New Testament, I believe it's every first day of the week. I think the scriptures lay that forth. I think there's a reason for that because we need to remember the cost of our freedom. We need to remember 
what Jesus paid so we could be spiritually free. And now that we are free, how will you handle your freedom? Will you handle your freedom with joy? There's many people that have freedom in this country and they don't have joy over their physical freedom. In fact, it's almost like they attack it many times. They attack the physical freedom that has been bought and paid for and they attack it. You know what? When I think about our spiritual freedom, how do we handle our spiritual freedom? Do we take it for granted? Do we not think about the cost? Do we not think about why Jesus died? Jesus did not die so that we could be passive Christians that we could be disengaged Christians, that we would be Christians that would not follow what God has said, that Christians that would not obey what He has asked us to do. Have we forgotten the sacrifice and the cost of freedom? When we look at this, there are some terms here that many people would try to push far away from freedom because they don't want them there. But as we read Romans chapter 6, I see the picture of obedience. And I picture this picture of when we are free, there is a change in our obligations. Freedom is not without obligations and responsibilities. And our spiritual freedom is not without obligations and responsibilities. It says, but God be thanked that though we were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We have a transition. It says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more unlawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness and holiness. There's a transition that's supposed to take place. We're going from, uh, we're going from uh, this... this uh, lack of freedom in terms of being a slave to sin, but we're going through this transition, but this transition has cause. The transition to spiritual freedom requires obedience, and it also requires being a slave to new things, serving new things. You used to serve sin, now serve God. How many times do Christians slip back into serving sin? How many times do Christians slip back into serving self? Satan is trying to drag you back to being a slave to him. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, doing what God does not want you to do and not obeying what God has asked you to do. It's a battle throughout our lives. It's a battle for our spiritual freedom. Now, God has paid the cost. We understand that. But do you understand that our spiritual freedom comes with this idea of obedience and this idea of serving new things? And you know how we can do this throughout life is we've got to think long term. As we look at verses 21 through 23, it says, For, it says, What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we look, Jesus has given us the path to freedom. This path is going to involve obedience and it's going to involve service. And I think that's not much different than the physical freedom which we enjoy in this country. But to stay on the path to spiritual freedom, I think we have to think long term. We have to think long term. If you stay a slave to sin, if you stay a slave to sin, how does that end? It ends with death. And we're talking about spiritual death. If you stay a slave to sin in this life, if you stay a slave to sin in this life, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. If you stay a slave to sin, if you look long term, there's only one way this ends. It ends with spiritual death. Now I want you to think about the path to spiritual freedom. The path that required a cost. It was the cost of God, but as we look and we examine this passage, it looks like a cost of self, a cost of obedience, a cost of service. If we serve sin, it ends in death. If we serve God, you know what it can end with? Eternal life. Are you thinking long term with your spiritual life? Many times people fall into the trap of just seeing the things that are right in front of them. And they cannot think long term. 
Many people struggle with seeing just the things that are right in front of them and they cannot think long term. Where are you going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? Where are you going to be 2,000 years? Where are you going to be? Think long term about this. If you stay a slave to sin, it ends in spiritual death. If we take the path of spiritual freedom provided by Jesus, access through obedience, we have a chance of everlasting life. Have you thought about your life? Psalm 90 was written by Moses, and he talks about how many years we might expect on this plane of life, 70 to 80 years. And I've talked about it before. I preached a lesson talking about the quarters of life, and I think people don't like to think about that in that way. Maybe God's blessed you with over time. But you think about that, 70 to 80 years. What have you done with your fight for spiritual freedom? Are you fighting for spiritual freedom? Are you doing those things that God would want you to do? You think about that. The first quarter of life, 0 to 20. 20 to 40, second quarter. 40 to 60, third quarter. 60 to 80, fourth quarter. And you say, well, I'm above 80. God's blessed you with overtime. We are not here forever. And we need to be focused on spiritual freedom. We need to be thinking long term. Long term for ourselves. Long term for our families. We need to be walking towards those spiritual treasures. In Matthew chapter 6, the Bible talks about the idea in verses 19 through 21, the idea of not laying up treasures on this earth, but laying up treasures in heaven. Are you thinking long term with your life? Are you thinking long term? If you're going to walk the path of spiritual freedom, there's some things that you have to leave behind. I do think of Moses. You know, I associate Moses with a physical freedom as he frees with the help of God, the children of Israel. But it talks about his faith in Hebrews chapter 11. I think Moses was thinking long term about his life in chapter 11 of Hebrews Verses 24 through 28, it says this, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should uh, touch them. You think about Moses. Moses had a choice to make. He had a choice to stay in his house in Egypt and really have a good physical life. But Moses decided to think long term and think about the treasures of heaven. Moses could have stayed in Egypt. He could have stayed in Pharaoh's house. He could have been rich and had all the pleasures, earthly pleasures that he wanted. He had a choice. And he chose to think long term and go after the heavenly treasures and not the physical treasures. You understand that if you're going to walk the path of spiritual freedom, you have to walk away from certain things and you're going to have to walk towards some things. What do you mean walk towards some things? You're going to have to obey God. You're going to have to do those things which God has asked you to do. There's not a path to spiritual freedom that goes around Jesus Christ and goes around obeying Jesus Christ. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other path to freedom but Jesus Christ. And that involves obeying Jesus Christ. What does God ask us to do? When we look in Acts chapter 2, we see some individuals that Peter preaches a message to. And I think that we see throughout the book of Acts, we see people becoming New Testament Christians. We see them hear the word, believe it, repent, confess, and be baptized. If we want to be on the path to spiritual freedom, we have to obey God. We can't say, God, I'm not going to do those things which you've asked me to do. We better be in compliance with what he has asked. Are you on the path to spiritual freedom?
You have to obey God. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. We'd love to help you in any way that we can if you come as we stand and as we sing.